<clears throat> so, greetings, hello. Um, it's Dr. Thomas Daffin speaking for my weekly broadcast uh, update on my campaign to stop Brexit and to rethink and have a second referendum. And I'm going to be talking today about some developments during the week. Um, last week, Sunday was uh, Easter Sunday, and I recorded a talk there, which was more theological and philosophical than, than normal. Um, <coughs> obviously, my opposition to Brexit is, is philosophical, empirical, historical, based on years of academic study and years of philosophical reflection and so on. Um, so the most important thing I want to announce today, Sunday the 28th of April, is that this last week I've taken a new initiative. I've made a decision to found a new academic centre um, for the study of this whole phenomenon of Brexit and its opposition, which is called Bremain, a technical term for those that oppose Brexit, uh, are you know, those who, who propose Bremain. So I've, I've called this the Centre for Bremain Studies. And it's completely the first of its kind. I think I'm the first academic to propose this, and I'm in contact with uh, a number of colleagues, and I will be contacting um, the political scientists in the UK in university departments that teach political studies. And it's something, obviously, I've taught I'm fascinated by. It's a fascinating field. I studied it at the University of London as part of my degree. Um, and I think that... Brexit makes absolutely no sense from a political studies perspective. It's a shocking, a shocking own goal by our own country. I mean, what country in its right mind would, would do Brexit? It wouldn't. So obviously it's not in its right mind. And, and unfortunately, you know, if you read history as I've done, countries do, do become possessed by, uh, you know, the wrong turn. And this happened in Nazi Germany. It happened in... Um, all absolutist and totalitarian states and systems where freedom of thought is clamped down on. I mean, I'm a, a liberal in the traditional Enlightenment European sense of believing in freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of research. I mean, that makes me a scientist of, of politics and, and philosophy. And um, so the Centre for Remain Studies will be an academic centre for free thinkers devoted to research into the origin of Brexit, how it came about, who was behind it, who was pushing for it, all the kind of um, evidence that we've got about the conspiracy behind the scenes to gerrymander the election result in 2016 is shocking. Carol Cadwallader has done some amazing work as a journalist to uncover um, what was going on behind the scenes with Data Analytica and the role of Steve Bannon, and so on. But it's, it's just the tip of the iceberg. I'm sure there's much more that has been suppressed. Um, <clears throat> and the role of Arab banks, and so on. All these things are just, um, you know, on the surface of the water, like the iceberg. The evidence is overwhelming, and it will be gone through with a forensic fine-tooth comb by my study centre, uh, that there were definitely conspiratorial forces behind the 2016 election, um, sorry, referendum. What I think is another field for research is, is their links to the Conservative Party and um, the Cabinet decision under Theresa May to interpret that result as an absolute, you know, we have to do this. I mean, there was nothing in law, there was nothing in common sense that said that. People of Scotland and Northern Ireland voted against Brexit, yet their views have been completely over, uh, you know, totally ignored with utterly disastrous consequences. So that's another reason as an academic I'm, I'm blowing the whistle here, along with many millions of others. But <clears throat> I've had opportunity and, and a sense of moral urgency and moral outrage to inform my research over the last two years into this, ever since that referendum. I also am fueled by the fact that a very close friend of mine was killed, probably murdered, um, who was active with me in anti-Brexit work, and he was found dead in circumstances that have still not been clarified. So it's, it's a possible murder case. Um, and the only thing he was doing was, was doing an awful lot of campaigning against Brexit. So in, in his honour, I've also launched this Centre for Brexit Studies, um, sorry, Remain Studies. 
Um, the reason I call it Centre for Brumain Studies is because I want to emphasise the positive. I don't want to um, just be against the negative, although I am. And of course, one of our jobs is to expose in great detail the, con the negative consequences of Brexit. But we should also stress the positive consequences of Bromain. And, you know, that needs doing clearly and, and comprehensively. So what kind of people can get involved with the centre? Well, it's open to all qualified academics and researchers and social scientists, political scientists and so on, who, who it doesn't matter what discipline they're working in. So... There are arguments to be made in favour of Bromain from a sociological perspective. There are arguments from a psychological perspective. I mean, the, the impact psychologically of this whole Brexit thing is catastrophic for people. Um, there are also implications for um, f philosophy in all its broad fields of study. So philosophers um, <clears throat> you know, who concern themselves with questions of ethics and, and wisdom and political philosophy and so on. You know, there are huge questions to ask philosophically. Um, and Britain has a huge tradition of philosophy. I mean, I was trained in philosophy in Britain. And we, we've, you know, I was, I was taught that what philosophy is, it's about the rational examination of, of choices and, and difficult, you know, situations. And then you apply the, the rules of reason and logic and, and evidence and so on, and then you reach a decision. The, uh, the underpinning of, of the democratic system that we live in was that we all get to have a say in that as, as in a constitutional democracy, um, and that our voices are respected. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, so there are huge questions about, um, about if, if the referendum was... was fabricated, which the evidence is huge that it was, who did that and why? The argument that, well, that was then and, and you know, the vote was to vote for Brexit um, and therefore there's no second referendum, which is Theresa May's constantly repeated mantra. And tragically, it seems to be Jeremy Corbyn has drunk from the same poisonous cup that she's drunk from. Uh, the, you know, that argument, I think, is unsound, philosophically speaking. Um, Everyone has the right to change their mind. The British people have obviously changed their mind to a considerable degree. Not everybody, but a lot of people. And I'm in touch with people who used to be strong Brexit voters and who now say, no, I've made a terrible mistake. You see, when we voted in 2016, the choice was not clear. We had no clue what kind of Brexit was going to be, what the consequences would be. Now we've seen what it looks like, and it's pretty horrific. We realise that it's going to lead to the breakup of the UK. Now, who in their right mind would vote for that? Um, it's going to lead to all kinds of dislocation and suffering for people who are British who are living in Europe. Um, of over a million people. It's going to lead to suffering and dislocation for uh, you know, at least the same number of Europeans happily living in throughout the UK and Scotland and wherever. It's going to lead to a tightening up of the control of all our lives by the petty bureaucrats who run things like the visa departments and the, you know, the, the government bureaucracies all over the place. And um, it's a nightmare. And also, um, it's, it's going to lead to a huge tightening up of the power of central government in Westminster, um, or that's what they expect, um, which none of us really voted for. I mean, I grew up in Britain. I love Britain. I'm a British citizen. It's a liberal democracy. We have freedoms that we take for granted. And this most shocking consequence of Brexit has been how easily they can be chipped away. <clears throat> and um, it seems to me this Conservative government have, have never studied political philosophy. I don't know what on earth they think they're doing. Um, I mean, there are a few intellectuals among them. I mean, Ken Clark is not a bad man. Um, you know, some of these, some of these conservatives. I mean, I mean, um, you know, have a have a have a, have an intellect, but a lot of them are highly educated. But what they're doing goes against the canons of received wisdom in, in British constitutional history, as far as I'm absolutely 100% certain. I mean, I trained as a citizenship studies teacher in the Welsh Marches when I trained, did my PGC in, in education, as well as, you know, doctorate and other degrees. I have a qualification to teach as a secondary school teacher, and I, 
I studied to train in religious studies, which is my passion, and also history, but also citizenship studies, which is a new thing. That, that it used to be called constitutional um, studies, and then it was rebranded citizenship studies. I think it's very important, um, and kids should learn about the British Constitution, what it is, what our country is, the UK, before it breaks up, you know. Uh, so, um, and there's complete ignorance about Ireland and Scotland and, and their role within the bigger UK and Wales. <coughs> All of these unique cultures which have their own voice, their own heritage, their own history. And, you know, I think one of the things Brexit um, has thrown up and, and which the Centre for Bromain Studies will be looking at is what are the longer term constitutional implications of this nightmare? If we can stop Brexit, as I believe we can, and there will be a second referendum, as I fervently pray, and it will this time be rejected. Well, that's not the end of the story. We, we seriously need a kind of forensic inquiry into how this nightmare situation happened. Uh, there was corruption, but we don't know on what kind of a scale and who was involved, and we don't know... I mean, we know that Philip May works for companies that directly benefit from Brexit, American companies that directly will benefit from Brexit. They've said so on the record. To me, this is corruption. You know, the, um, a sitting prime minister should not have these kind of personal family involvements, and it's against the parliamentary code. She should either this man Philip May should resign from his company, or she should resign as prime minister. This is contrary to the parliamentary code of ethics. You don't have a sitting prime minister who who stands to gain personally in her family from a policy that is so contrary to the benefit of the country as a whole, but to her private advance and interests. You know, um, and yet, and yet, who's enforcing this parliamentary code? It has actually no teeth. I've been in communication with the Speaker of Parliament, and um, you know, we're into new territory in 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 law because, um, I mean, he's written back to me, said he's not an expert in parliamentary law, but he does have advisers. And the question, if, if a sitting prime minister, I don't care who, um, you know, break, breaks the parliamentary code, there have to be consequences. It can't be just, like, ignored. So that's one constitutional question for reform that I would be, with the Centre for Bromain Studies, you know, doing some research on, which is what kind of reform is needed to give the Parliamentary Code of Conduct some teeth. I think it must be straight, um, you know, strengthened. And also, if somebody breaks it, I think they have to, you know, account for their actions, apologise, amend, or they have to be sacked from Parliament. They have to lose their office as, as, as MPs or Lords. We had this scandal with the Lords all, you know, buying duck islands and things. I mean... You know, and, and they were rightly censored and fined, and I think one or two of them were sacked. I can't... Yeah, I think so. Well, that's right. But, I mean, it has to be applied in the Commons too. So that's one of the constitutional consequences of this Brexit nightmare. Um, first, we have to bring, bring this governing cabal down, and that can only be done democratically. So in the forthcoming elections, we have hopefully European parliamentary elections coming up. I mean, in any future election. I mean, everyone should get out there and vote because in a democracy, that's the important thing. And although I live in Europe now, I'm registered to vote as a UK citizen um, and will be. And, and I think you have to decide, you know, who is the most strong um, candidate for Remain or Bromain in your constituency or in your region um, who's been consistent about that and who stands the most likelihood of being elected. I, I personally think it's scandalous the Labour Party won't come out as a Remain party and that Jeremy Corbyn is, uh, you know, severely handicapped in intellect to think that this fudging he's doing is in any way in, in the interests either of the nation or the country or the, or the Labour Party. Um, I've said this before many times, you know, I've not met Jeremy Corbyn, but I'm not impressed by his intellect. Um... I was much more impressed by people like John Smith and even Tony Blair had a had a had a good mind. <clears throat> um, Jeremy Corbyn's brother, Piers Corbyn, is 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 you know an oddball climate change denier who 
is a maverick. And it seems to me that Jeremy Corbyn is, is a maverick from a maverick background who, who should um, stand and, you know, uh, reform his approach on this because um, he, what he seems to be doing is putting, putting his hopes in a general election and being elected as a uh, prime minister ahead of standing firmly against Brexit. He, I think he's thinking, I think his, his advisors are saying, like Seamus Milne and others, that you've got to equivocate on this because if you come out strongly for a second referendum, you'll be accused of betrayal and then you'll lose the populist, you know, white working class vote that voted for Brexit, some of it, and then you'll never be elected and the media will make mincemeat of you. So it's a fear thing. They're afraid of losing that vote. I would say that this is, um, and, and uh, their hope is that, you know, if they fudge long enough, eventually there'll be a second, uh, there'll be a general election and Corbyn will win. You know, that's, you can see it, that's how they're thinking. Uh, with all due respect, it's a false proposition because, you know, if Brexit goes ahead, there won't be a UK to even be worth being Prime Minister of anymore. Scotland is going to leave the Union. Northern Ireland is going to descend into chaos from which eventually it will reunite with the South after a referendum, and, and Sinn Féin are campaigning actively for that, and the other political forces of democratic Northern Ireland. Um, you know, it's, it's in the Good Friday Agreement, and, and it will happen. There will be that second referendum on the reunification of Ireland, and I assure you they will vote for that because they're not idiots. And um, they'd much rather be part of a, a, a healthy, big, island-wide Ireland, part of the European Union, the greatest free market um, trading nation block in the world, and the greatest cultural and spiritual block of nations, standing for human rights and, and uh, all kinds of things. You know, the Irish have created a citizens' assembly in the south. Um, they've, they've moved ahead with the thing that climate change people are saying we should have in in the UK. Well, the Irish have already done it. They're way ahead of the game on this. So, of course, the people of the North will, will vote to join them. And, I mean, a few old diehards probably won't. And they'll take their money off to the Isle of Man. Um, you know, good riddance, because they don't, they're not, you know, they haven't got a clue what they're doing, these people. Um, the, the DUP think they're being loyal to Britain uh, by propping up the Tory government. They're actually, like, I don't know, you know, they're, they're holding the sores as Sawney Bones, you know, chops up the victim. I mean, they're destroying the UK. So the DUP and these so-called unions have no right to call themselves unionists. Their actions are leading to the dismemberment of the United Kingdom, directly and, and, and uh, causally. And, and this is, these are just propositions of political science. I'm not, you know, this is not a polemic. I'm like, a, I'm like Thomas Hobbes here, right? I'm simply looking at this as a matter of... of um, you know, causal effect in political change, what what happens in a certain sequence of consequences. That's what Thomas Hobbes was trying to study. He was also here in France. He was he was the founder of British modern political science, and I studied in his, you know, wake. Um, and that's why I'm blowing the whistle. This is a catastrophe. Um, so, okay, um, that's what the Centre for Brain Studies will be doing. Um, it's open to all genuine, you know, trained academics. So whatever state, you can be a student studying, you know, political philosophy or diplomatic history or whatever. And if you think that this Brexit thing is a serious error and want to use your academic skills to expose that, then please get in touch. You can join um, and there will be talks, conferences, you know, the usual thing. Um, I'm happy to come to any UK academic department to give, to give talks and lead seminars. Um, I have a load of questions. I'm a Socratic teacher. I don't have. I have some answers. I have some working hypotheses, and um, I'm working on a book, uh, which I produced already a blueprint of. It's like a manifesto of Romaine studies, and it lists 217 discrete topics of research that we need to go into to stop Brexit. Um, now. Uh, you know, they are things like what, what can different academic disciplines contribute to um, the study of Romain? And it's huge, obviously, from all different varieties. I mean, even literature. People could be a literary scholar, like my daughter. She's doing a PhD in you know, Oxford uh, into um, 
you know, literature in the 18th century. I mean, in, in the history of British literature, it's a European-wide phenomenon. English literature, so-called, beginning with, with uh, you know, the early Anglo-Saxon epics, Beowulf and so on, these were continental traditions that were transplanted to the island. These came from Scandinavia. The existing Celtic literatures, which they blended and emerged with, um, were already ancient before the Anglo-Saxons even arrived. The Irish literature goes back to the Bronze Age, the poetry of, of the Druids and Bards of Ireland, um, telling the stories of Finn McCool and so on. These go back to Bronze Age Ireland. We're talking a poetic tradition as old as ancient Greek and the Homeric epics. And so, so people that study literature in academia know this. That's why they treasure the European Union, because they can be talking to some academic in Germany or Holland or France or Italy, and, and they can meet up and go to each other's conferences. They can get a lecturing job in Sweden for a year or, or Italy or whatever. You know, this is... And, and literary scholars, I mean, I've, I'm a great lover of literature. I'm a poet and bard myself. I've written many poems and, and given lectures on, on poetics. I run an order of poets and bards and druids for peace. You know, I'm coming from that tradition. I love travelling around Europe and writing poetry. I mean, it's what Shelley used to do, for God's sake. He was the inspirer of me as a young student at Brighton Grammar School when I was a boy. I mean, I discovered Shelley and thought, wow, that's it, poetry. And Shelley was, was um, a polymath. He was from Sussex, thrown out of Oxford for asking too many questions, which anyone with any sense would be. Um, and um, he lived in Wales. He, he, he loved the Welsh Celtic bardic traditions. He identified with that. Um, he ran a sort of hippie commune in Wales uh, back in the 1800, early 1800s um, with his girlfriend and other people. And they all wrote poetry, you know. And, and he was sympathetic to the ideals of the French Revolution but didn't like the methods and wanted a spiritual transformation. Like Nicolas Bonville... Um, and other savants of the time, like me, you know, we, we don't want a violent revolution. We're peace people, like Shelley, and we want to do it with poetry. <laughs> and then, of course, he went to Europe, and he lived in Italy. He lived in Lucca, a beautiful town up in northern Tuscany. And, um, you know, he lived, he, he, he adored Europe and the classical heritage. Him and Keats and Byron, they were all Europhiles. And um, why should it be only the upper classes that can go and explore Europe? The Grand Tour was the secret of the English aristocracy because they did their Grand Tour before they were regarded as properly educated. Unless you'd been to Rome and Paris and, and uh, you know, the other great European capitals, you, you were regarded as just a, a lightweight. Well, so that's still true, my friends, but it's, it should be for all of us, not just the aristocracy, who will go on with their money doing that. No, it should be for everybody. And that's what the European Union stands for. That's why the true lovers of wisdom, and I've just gone into the question of literary scholars, um, should be upholding this, this right, these rights and these freedoms. It's, ultimately, it's the right to be inspired. You know, when I go to Italy or Greece, I write amazing poetry. I don't when I'm in Watford or, um, you know... Wolverhampton, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, drizzly English rainy cities, I love them, and don't get me wrong, you know, I love England, but it doesn't quite hit the poetic heights, unless you go off to the Welsh mountains, which is why I lived there for ten years, or the Scottish mountains, that's why I lived there. Um, so, so yes, all lovers of poetry, all lovers of the muses should, should be opposing this nonsense that is called Brexit. And, and, but it's not just enough to oppose it. We have to get our act together, think this through really, really deeply, study it, you know, do, do learned papers, write books, have conferences, you know, rally the, rally the academia and, and the intelligentsia and the, the you know, thinking people of our country because we are a thinking people. As I was saying, you know, Chaucer helped found English literature and he was part educated in France. He travelled all over. Um, he loved Italy, he loved the Low Countries, and he absorbed all that literature and then brought it to England and created the Canterbury Tales, um, which is set on the pilgrimage to the tomb of Thomas a Becket, who was another great Europhile, um, spent part of his life in France, and he took exile here in France as a 
theologian and Archbishop of Canterbury because he was a European wide thinker and uh, the king had, had gone mad and was surrounded by a bunch of thugs who were anti intellectual, anti Christian, and just into power. And you know, this, this archetypal struggle we're having over Brexit it looks like round two to me. Um, the kind of power people who think they are powerful have tried to hijack the British state. And, and Brexit is their means of doing it. Um, you know, discuss. That's a hypothesis. I mean, it's a, it's a hypothesis in political science. Um, so, uh, so many, many fields need to be studied. 217. I'm not going to go into them all. If you want to know the details, you know, contact me. Join, join and support the work of the CBS, Centre of Remain Studies. And... Um, you know, it's a very important work. I'll, I'll, I'll share weekly these little broadcasts, but I can't go into all the details, all the nuances. Um, okay, so what else? I want to say just something about um, the philosophical challenges that are facing us in this Brexit thing. And also, I want to start by acknowledging the, the heroism of the Extinction Rebellion people in London. And I know that some people say they don't like them and, you know, they don't agree with what they're doing. Um, I run a thing called the Global Green University. I'm an, I'm an academic in the eco-philosophical tradition of my colleagues, John Francis Phipps and uh, Henrik Skolomowski and, um, you know, many other um, philosophers who've influenced me. And so I have a kind of green, a soft green um, dimension to my work as a philosopher and if you've read my books you'll know that um, so as a philosopher I think we have some difficult questions to ask about Extinction Rebellion and its goals and aims and, and how we can get there from where we are and I've been some of my family are involved in that sequence of protests and so on I'm interested in who are the intellectuals behind it what are their theories and what are they thinking one of the leading figures behind it is this man called Roger Hallam, who was an organic farmer, become a sort of full-time rebel and, and um, leveller and eco-activist. He's at King's College London, which is I, I've also studied at the university in King's College, and he's supposedly doing a PhD in, in uh, rebellion. <laughs> I, I would love to know who his supervisor is, and, you know... What, what, whether the supervisor is challenging him enough because it seems to me Roger Hallam's ideas are not fully worked out if I was his PhD supervisor I would, you know, I'd want to clarify a few points um, I mean one of, one of the things that I think is lacking from the extension rebellion world view and concept I mean it's, it's, it's fundamental messages like immediately stop carbon, all emissions well that's not feasible, it's not realistic, and the figures they put are simply not viable. We have to, as a planet, agree to move in that direction and agree certain stages. Um, and we have to involve all the nations, not just the UK, but America, Russia, China, all, you know, India and so on. And we have to look at the global economy as a whole and say, well, what, how can we do this? Now, I think, as a philosopher and a peace philosopher, you know, the single best way we can immediately seriously reduce our carbon emissions as a planet is by demilitarizing the planet. This is simply an a economic fact. The vast expenditure of money um, on militarism around the planet, the biggest expenditure is coming from the Pentagon, but Russia, Britain, you know, all the rest are up there with it. Um, the, I once went to a talk by Greenpeace at a conference at King's College, actually, in the wake of the first Gulf War, and it was a very good presentation um, about the ecological impact of, of the Gulf War. This was the first Gulf War in 1993, when the Allies, you know, kicked the Iraqis out of Kuwait, and the Kuwaitis set off, uh, sorry, the Iraqis set off huge oil fields, they were sending Scud missiles at, um, at Israel, you know, the whole thing was a nightmare, which I lived through. And it was just after I'd set up the institute, my Institute of Peace Studies and Global Philosophy, at the University of London, right? 
And this chap from Greenpeace, who was a very learned man, um, said, uh, they had a report which they presented, which I still have here in the Institute Library, that the military is the single biggest um, user of resources on the planet in aggregate, and the single biggest polluter, and the single biggest emitter of carbon. If you add up all the military planes that are buzzing around the planet, all the military ships that are sailing around the planet, all the submarines, all the factories that are making these weapons that, that run them, and all the soldiers that are then you know, going around, sometimes fighting and setting off bombs and weapons and so on. If you put all that you know, in the palm of your hand, that is the single biggest um, cause of planetary warming. Um, and if we could get an international peace treaty, if we could agree to demilitarize the planet to 0.5% of its current levels, this is what was called for at an international conference of peace thinkers in India that I was at um, in December 2017. We received the Jaipur Declaration. And we've called for all military forces on the planet to demilitarize. And then that expenditure could go into peace, construction, look, Nepal's just had another earthquake, you know, they need homes rebuilt. Um, we need research that's currently going into building weapons, into finding out how to predict better these earthquakes and how to build preventative, you know, town structures and, and so on that, that stop killing. Um, so life-affirming peace expenditure to replace 95% of the military budgets around the world and to fund the Green New Deal that this planet needs. Now, it's interesting, I used that term a few months ago, um, and suddenly other people are starting to use it. It's great, the American woman started using it, that great congresswoman, and, and now it's all being talked about in Parliament, but they don't actually know what they're talking about. <clears throat> it doesn't mean just insulating your homes. It doesn't mean, you know, just, just sort of uh, walking around in sandals and turning vegan. It means demilitarizing the planet. That's what will fund the Green New Deal. And so peace and preventing global warming and the worst effects of, of you know, uh, man's devastation of nature, <clears throat> including each other. I mean, I mean, the way we devastate each other in, in, in war is the worst you know, crime of all, in my opinion. If you read you know, the, the tragedies of wars I've done as a scholar, um, <clears throat> that's why... You want to stop it. And I nursed people that have fought in World War II. You know, the horrors of all that. We don't want to go back to that. So, so this is my important message here for all the people that were swept up with the excitement of Extinction Rebellion, which is great. Also, get active campaigning for peace because they are actually the same cause. And what, what I'm very suspicious of is, is uh, you know, <clears throat> people that haven't joined up the dots there aren't enough serious intellectuals around who, who can join up the dots. Our education systems don't turn out people with broad-mindedness. Unfortunately, the way the PhD system is set up is you have to become a very narrow thinker to succeed in the way that academia is structured at the moment, which I think is against the best interests of, of humanity and against the best interests of, of Britain and Europe. We need joined-up thinkers. We need Leonardo da Vinci's who can excel in a number of fields and see the interconnections. <clears throat> and I'll be celebrating Leonardo's um, 500th anniversary of his death um, in, in just a few days' time with a lecture um, about the progress on the Leonardo da Vinci Peace Prize. And to me, that's part of what Extinction Rebellion should be campaigning for. But I heard nothing in Greta Thunberg's lovely speeches. She never unless I'm completely deaf and blind, I don't hear her talking about the connection with peace. She doesn't have, she's not made the connections, but then look, she's only 16, she's not, and peace studies is not taught in schools, although there are peace centres for academia in Sweden of a high calibre, and they have 